What's up, what's up, everybody? It's Brandman Sean, and I'm here today with a special guest, Jason Grishkoff. Got it right that time. And man, if you don't know him, he is the founder of Submit Hub, one of the staple names in music when it comes to getting your music connected through curators and other forms of placements. There's so many forms, which I actually want to get into this um, in this interview. But if you want to get your music heard and shared online, this is one of the key sites. And they have a really unique model that goes a, a lot against a lot of things we talk about, not against in terms of um, don't do it, but it's just a completely differently alternative than things we even touch on usually. So I really want to use not this space just to learn about Submit Hub, but how artists should get their music heard when they go the route of curators, when they go the route of uh, blog placements today. How do we know what a relevant blog looks like today? All these types of things. So um, with, without further ado, um, appreciate you, Jason, for being on. And if you will, if you will, can you just give us a very, very quick snippet on what was your background that made you start Submit Hub? And then I want to get right into the things that I know is going to give them immediate value. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you for the intro. Pleasure to be here. I'll give you the, the quick skinny. So I started music blogging back in 2007, 2008. Right. Music blogs were it. It was the, the way to go. SoundCloud didn't exist. Spotify didn't exist. YouTube music wow. wasn't a thing. Music blogs were where you went to download your illegal MP3s, build up your library, get your Winamp playlist going and looking strong. So it was a good time to be in that music discovery space. And I started a blog called Indie Shuffle, which is still alive and running today, 15 years later. <clears throat> the, uh, the landscape changed a lot in that time. Uh, but one of the things that happened was that music blogs collectively became king and queen makers in the industry. So if you were an artist and you managed to get picked up by 10 of the bigger blogs, and next thing you know, your track was charting on this website called Hype Machine. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but Hype Machine was this, this website that kept track of all the blogs. It would tell you who was blogging about what, how many people were doing it. And every single major label and industry professional was using Hype Machine as their a &R discovery tool. So what people quickly figured out was that if you wanted good PR coverage and you wanted to blow up, you needed to get the blogs to write about your music. In the early days, that was doable. When I started my blog Indie Shuffle, I was stoked to receive new emails from artists. I was like, oh, sick, this is cool, you know? I'm out here looking for music, but you're actually pitching me. And I found some cool stuff that way, but over the years, that strategy became more well-known and there were these spreadsheets traveling around with like, here's a list of 500 emails and it was untargeted, it was a mess, man. So by the time 2014 rolled around, I was getting 300 plus emails a day in my inbox. It was like, here's a Dropbox. Here's a SoundCloud link. Here's a, a Spotify link. Here's a YouTube video of me playing in my bedroom. Like, it was just all over the place. And the, the thing going through my head was that there had to be a better way to manage all of that for my own blog. So I took some of the coding chops that I had picked up building and growing Indie Shuffle. And I built a really simple form that people could fill out. Mm -hmm. Artist name, song title, give me a link. And then I used my code to make sure everything was in this consistent feed that looked a lot like your SoundCloud feed. And yeah. next to each song, I had a thumb up button and a thumb down button. Thumb up, you got an email and said, hey, Jason from Indie Shuffle likes your song. He's going to blog it. Thumb down, you got an email saying, hey, he's listened to your song. Unfortunately, he's not going to cover it. <clears throat> so overnight, Submit Hub was a bit of a game changer. 10 to 20 music blogs were signed up within the first week. So these were people I was peers with, networked with, and knew. And so when I pitched this tool to them, it was a bit of a no-brainer. They're like, yeah, please save me from my inbox. It's crazy. Yeah. And then from an artist's perspective, this was actually one of the first times you could guarantee that your music was getting listened to. You didn't have to pay $2,000 a month for a publicist to do it. You and, and your, your emails, like they were just getting ignored at that time, right? Sending out 500 emails, good luck getting any response, except for people being like, yo, $20 for a placement. Payola existed back then. It exists in different forms now. But so yeah, SubmitHub was born at the end of 2015. And the idea was to help 
curators manage that flow of submissions and to enable artists to actually be able to, to make those connections again. So it's grown since then. This month, we should be hitting our 30 millionth submission. Wow. That's a bunch. Yeah, we're approaching 1 million artists. There are close to 3,000 active curators, playlisters, et cetera. And um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been a seven-year journey from our side. And, and I think at this point, you can, you can the core product of Submit Hub is to approach it as, as a smart directory. It's like those old spreadsheets, but way better. Uh, we are essentially curating the list of curators and making sure that you are contacting people who you can trust and that you have all the information about them prior to sending to it. So we'll make sure that if you're making a hip hop song, you're going to be targeting people who like hip hop. And we'll tell you how many listeners they have on their playlist. No one else has that. We've got that. We'll give it to you. We'll tell you how often they share, where they share, how long they share. It's just like, it's it's a directory on steroids, man. So yeah, that's Submit Hub in a nutshell. And there's a whole bunch of peripheral things we do, but that's yeah. <laughs> Got you, got you. So I appreciate that explanation. You immediately make me think about those numbers you said, approaching a million artists, right? I yeah. think last I saw was somewhere around 800,000 and then 3,000 curators, which is a lot of curators, but man, that ratio, right, of artists to curators is massive. So of yeah. course you get to that problem of, man, there's so many artists that are submitting and I can only get to so many, like that problem you you experience. But even with that, at that moment, uh, I'm at, at, at the current moment, how exactly are you helping the curators manage that? Then I want to add something for the artists as well. Okay. So from the curator standpoint, most of them are getting between 10 to 100 submissions per day. And the okay. carrot that keeps them going are these premium credits. So each curator asks for either one, two, or three premium credits. And you can buy these premium credits for anywhere between 60 cents to a dollar each, depending on how many you're buying, whether you're applying coupons, there's lots of coupons floating around. So when you're pitching your song to them, you're dangling this money in front of them. And the idea is that they can earn that money if they respond within 48 hours, listen for at least 20 seconds and give you 10 plus words of feedback. If they check off those three boxes, they're entitled to those credits and that's their earning. So from the curator side, we're not only solving the problem of their inboxes being overflowing and, and, and managing these submissions, we're helping them ensure that the submissions are targeted and they're earning a little bit of money. I'd say most of them are earning between 100 to $300 a month through it. So it's not big money, but it's enough to reinvest in ads to help grow their playlist, stuff like that. Uh, there are definitely some bigger names earning $3,000, $4,000, $5,000 a month handling their submissions through Submit Hub. So <clears throat> that from the curator side uh, is one of the primary benefits. But also if you're on there, like it, it helps with your reputation and your name brand. So you're getting out there. If you're listed on Submit Hub, you're going to be hit up by every other Submit Hub competitor trying to sign you up. <laughs> and and it just it means that you've gone through our, our quality review process. So there is some some like genuine stuff going on there. And then we also give each of the curators a lot of tools so they can like when they find a song they like, they can schedule it to be automatically added to their playlist on this date. And they can schedule a removal for this date. They can rearrange their playlists. They get insights to a whole bunch of stats that we have that they can't get, like the average listeners number. That's not a Spotify number. That's our number. So we're kind of a number of their average ooh, listeners. magic. Uh, <laughs> no, it's pretty straightforward. Um, as an artist, you have access to the Spotify for artists dashboard and you can see what your individual playlists got you. So mm -hmm. what we do is about three weeks after an artist has been added to a playlist, we reach out to them and we pay them to send us their Spotify for artists insights. And so from that, we're able to determine how many listeners they got from each playlist. And usually what happens is, you know, an artist will get on five or six playlists. So when they send us that data, we get five or six relevant data points for the playlisters on our site. And then we also have a deal with one of the major labels, as well as one of the major distributors. And those guys give us some of their insights as well, because they, I mean, they have 
they have all the Spotify for artists data for all of their artists, right? So we can actually say, you know, here's a random playlist. Can you tell me if any of your artists are in here and how many listeners they're getting from it? So we were able to get that data and then we show it publicly. Like anyone can see it. That that's You don't even have to have an account. You can just go onto Submit Hub and see what every playlist is averaging in terms of listeners. Yeah, I saw some of that and I, I like that about the site, right? Just that that tease that I could just engage without logging in at all. But of course the value is still there, right? And then in some ways that prevents people from having to do uh, to be like a wasteful login, create a login just to see it and they don't want to use the site. So I'm sure there's a benefit. I, I, I hate that stuff, man. When you have to, when you, when you have to log in to even see what a website is doing, I hate it. So um, yeah, everything is there publicly visible for you to see upfront without an account. And, and that has obvious benefits and, and drawbacks. So I've, I've, I alluded to this earlier, but there are competitors who just come in and take that data from us and use that to bolster their own stats uh, as well as to find all the playlisters. So if you, as I mentioned, if you get signed up as a playlister on Submit Hub, it's a matter of days until a bunch of the other guys start reaching out to you being like, hey, have you joined our playlisting network? So a great sign though, man. I, I had a festival. Um, that was how I first kind of got started in the entertainment music space. And what I learned, we had built up so much clout that when new locations open and people would use our event basically to bring in business from other places, they would be like, man, as soon as y'all have announced your flyer, we got so many inquiries to use this space, right? Because people were watching us like that. So it sounds like you guys have a little of that leader impact as well. Yeah, but look, I don't let my guard down. I think it's important for me to keep a track of what everyone else is doing as well, right? So I watched your interview with Harry from Daily Playlist just to see what those guys are up to, the uh, lessons they're learning and the ways that they're trying to help artists. Uh, those are important things for me to keep an eye on. Otherwise, I'm just going to get sort of lazy and people are going to catch up. So it's important to me that we keep moving forward. So there's a lot of new features. Everyone says that, right? Lots of new features. But at the end of the day, the more value we can deliver to artists, the more they'll come back and use Submit Hub. Uh, and that's that's a difficult thing to accomplish in this space, as you know, right? Like not everyone can get the value they're looking for, um, but we're trying, we're trying. So with that being said, if you can just simplify it for me as an artist, how do I know your curators are vetted, right? I know you say they're vetted, I, I guess I can only trust, but technically what is your process for vetting curators? That's a better way of saying it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, so for a curator to join Submit Hub, they have to go through an application review process. About 20% of the applicants get approved. So 80% of them get rejected. And I can give you insight into some of the things that we're looking at. One of the first ones we look at is their historical Spotify growth chart. Like we're speaking about Spotify specifically, because I think that's the, the the most relevant one that people are interested in. But we look at their growth to see if there's been any unexplainable spikes in their followers. So the way you'll typically identify this is, you know, we have a lot of this data on our side, but for the for a normal artist, you could go to a platform like um, Chart Metric or Spot on Track. Both of these are websites that that keep track of playlists. And they'll show you the daily Spotify growth <clears throat> and you can see these spikes. So one of the things to look for in those spikes, because they're not always cut and dry, is a sudden overnight spike with nothing after that. And I'll tell you why it's not cut and dry, because uh, you've done a lot of this yourself, influencer marketing, right? It has a short time span, especially if you're doing Instagram stories. So we often see playlisters who have a background in influencer marketing. And so they grow their playlist that way and they keep it engaged. What you'll see with those spikes is a pretty quick overnight growth, but then another 24 to 48 hours of slow, like additional growth as well. So <clears throat> growth of followers is something we look at, but it's not always straightforward. Like there's a guy who, uh, this is driving me nuts. Three days ago, he uploaded a video to YouTube about Submit Hub being a scam. And his proof was this playlister. He's like, Guaranteed scam. Look, he grew by a thousand followers in a day. Boom. I, on my side, noticed that within five minutes of it happening, reached out to the playlister, 
And he actually sent us a bunch of proof. He's like, oh no, here's the story. You can go check it out right now. I'll get the stats when it's done. Here's the invoice I, I paid to the, the influencer. And you can like see all of this there. So moral of the story is that looking at followers is a nice beginning, but it's yeah. not the like the thing. So we got to look at more, right? <clears throat> uh, here's another huge red flag. You guys were talking about a website called Playlist Supply at one point. So it's possible you've seen this as well. But what Playlist Supply does is they scan all of the playlists on Spotify for Instagram handles or Gmail addresses. It's actually really easy. You can even do it yourself. If you go search in Spotify for like rap and gmail.com, it'll show you a bunch of playlists that have a Gmail address. For us, that's a pretty big red flag. Usually when someone's listing their Instagram or their Gmail, <clears throat> they're trying to hustle for money. They want you to pay them. So as soon as you reach out, and you'll find this on Playlist Supply, as soon as you reach out to them, 90% plus are going to either ask for some sort of playlist exchange, which is okay. That's not a violation of Spotify's terms that I'm aware of, but, but the majority of them want money, right? They're going to make $20 for position number three. Huge red flag violates Spotify's policy. And we typically find that the people who are willing to charge for placement like that are also the ones who are happy to go out and buy fake followers and bots, right? They're not in it because they love music, they're in it to make money and they're going to screw you over algorithmically because they're just putting songs and their playlist of anyone who's willing to pay. So the quality is typically lower, which means the skip rates are high and the genre matching is, is often non-existent. So, like, like, so you got a rap song, you'll be right next to a country song and an EDM song. It is bad news for Spotify's algorithm. So but you're saying that all of you guys as create curators are doing it just for the love of curation they are making money on submit hub but not a single one of them can be bribed with payola to get placement but how um, do you find they how do we how do we know curating a playlist takes time right right yeah and because of that yes i'm making my 100 to 300 dollars i know you said there's some who are making more but that's not a lot of money right and then yeah. I'm sure there's making money from other sites as well, but overall, it's probably not substantial through that method, right? The, right. the, the companies you name, right? Including yourself. So are you finding most of these people who are not scammers, right? Or who are not going to charge you, even if they deliver on the problems? I'm not going to put them in a scammer category. They're just doing something that's uh, in, in the gray um but it's not great it's it's clearly okay. against spotify's well, rules it's well, like you know, i'm not boom. here's people say we're in the gray right pay for consideration is gray here's here's my my okay black, yeah, it's sorry. black and white in terms of spotify's terms right and yeah. all the galleries i mean gray in terms of what you promise your customer right so it's like the macro you know institutional versus all right, I told you I'm going to do it. So I at least delivered on my promise to you, right? right. Um, but so I'm saying the people do, who aren't those though, right? Who aren't charging for a playlist, who aren't doing uh, bots or anything like that. What are they doing it for? Do, do you do you find they're building some type of brand somehow and, and monetizing some other way? Are these strictly just kids for the most part who just have extra time on their hands and are having fun what's going on here what's the incentive to be a a curator it's it's a good question and and there are a few different answers to it i think much like uh musicians there are many different reasons that people make music some do it because they love making music and they are never planning on being big and there are others who hustle because they want to get big on the playlister side you got a lot of them who are just doing it because they love finding music and they love being recognized for that, right? These guys are 99% doing it as a hobby. The money isn't the driver here necessarily. It's a nice little pocket change, but they've all got day jobs, right? Curation doesn't take eight hours a day. These guys are spending one, maybe two hours when they get home instead of, you know, it's like you, people need something to do on the internet, right? And you get hooked on things. Some people get hooked on scrolling through Instagram. Others get hooked on making really cool informational videos, for their YouTube channel and playlisters are hooked on that process of sitting down, listening to music and discovering it. You've also got some who are running labels. 
So they're using their playlists as a way to sort of big up their own artists as well as their brand, right? You've got some who are part of much larger things. Uh, uh, these are typically larger blogs like Stereo Fox, Ear Milk, uh, <clears throat> Burp FM, Alex Rainbow, a lot of these YouTube channels that are also labeled this, that, that. So they, these are the, the few who are doing it full time. Uh, and, and generally, though, I think an important thing to understand with most of these playlist curators is that they are hobbyists in the same way that many artists are also hobbyists. They're not doing it because they want to make a living from it. They're doing it because this is their creative outlet that they love working in. So, yeah, it's not a get rich quick thing. And, and we definitely don't want to work with the people who are hustling these payments, because in my mind, they're they're doing it for the wrong reason. They're doing it because money is is there and the, the quality of their playlists often suffers as a result. And that has a direct bearing on your potential to perform well on Spotify. So, yeah, I mean, we've got we've got 1500 Spotify playlists on, on Submit Hub. They're not all perfect, right? Some of them are definitely there because they're trying to make money, especially if they're in a developing nation like Turkey or south america right a dollar there goes a lot further than a dollar in the states but but a lot of the guys especially the americans and the europeans where a dollar doesn't go that far they're doing it because they they love it so yeah you, you'll find everything on there but by and large that's that's where people are they're, they're doing it because they they have a passion for it the same way artists like making music got it got it i would love to hear your clear take by the way on the payola concept more so in terms of not the legality of it, but the, I don't even know if I want to say ethics, but just does it make sense? Do you have a problem with it? Because outside of Spotify said it's illegal, but do you have a problem with, hey, I paid to put you on my platform, right? And then I play your music. Do you have an issue with that? I come from an, I, I call myself an old school blogger in a way. So uh -huh. back in the, in the 2005 to 2015 span, music blogging was all about your, your credibility uh, if for discovering new artists and sharing them. And many of us were able to make our revenue from advertising. Back then, advertising on the internet was accessible to anyone. It wasn't just dominated by Facebook and Google, right? M blogs were making money, knitting blogs, cooking blogs, music blogs, whatever. We were all making money. Uh, and that was that transition from magazine advertising to digital advertising. And with that came this ethos that the our job as music tastemakers was to be doing it for the integrity of it. We wanted to find the artists no one's ever heard of because you get clout if that artist blows up and you can be like, that was me, I found them first, right? Uh, when, when in reality, it never was like that cut and dry. But still, there are definitely blogs who would, take credit for discovering artists who ended up blowing up. And so, yeah, personally, I think that as soon as there's guaranteed payment without disclosure, you are compromising your integrity as a curator. And you're also, in a sense, fooling yourself as an artist because you're not getting a genuine fan here and you're not, you're rarely finding someone who's genuinely passionate about your music. They're sharing it because you paid them. There's an entire platform built around this now, MusoSoup. It is literally, you put your song up and the bloggers come along and they offer you placement. They'll be like, hey, I love your song, $30 and I'll write about it. If you don't pay me, I won't share it. It's So it's like straight up payola. And personally, I've taken a very hard line on it. I'm not a big fan of it. I'm coming from a different like background there. I do. And I think, I think where it becomes okay is when there's disclosure that on it is an side? advertorial on the on the publisher on the publisher's side and and i don't even i don't even need that to be like this you know i don't want to have a big orange banner that's like this artist paid me twelve dollars fifty through paypal and here's their like just say you know this this article was published as part of a promotional campaign for so-and-so's new song like that it's a subtle way to do it but in my mind what you're doing there is you are you're disclosing ethically that there's been money exchanged for the promotion of that content. So yeah, I, I'm I'm a bit of an old school, like hardcore payola is, is bad. And at the end of the day, you're only fooling yourself, right? You're paying money to people who are, I, I just don't think it's going to lead to genuine fan relationships. 
the, the way I see it is it's happening all around us regardless. So if I'm a if I have somebody, a friend that's a curator and they spent all this time to build a platform, every, everywhere else, people are charging for real estate, right? So you're borrowing my real estate. So I think you have the ability to charge for whatever you put on your site, right? That, that part makes sense to me. So if somebody just wants to advertise, cool. Music is technically advertised. Of course, that great space is, like you said, is if I'm presenting myself as a curator, I should like, like it, right? Like I'm presenting yeah. something as I'm choosing because I'm putting it here because I genuinely like that. But I think that right there, you can have both. And I say this because of my experience on TikTok. And I haven't seen this anywhere like this until TikTok came, um, where at scale, I see more and more and more, not curators, um, just creators who are unwilling to post music that they don't actually like, right? And I think that's it good. That's good. Works in multiple directions. One, because the post probably won't perform as well. They're not going to have like because it's just like people aren't going to listen to bad music. Um, the idea doesn't come as cleanly. Like, I remember I can't remember her name right now, but it was um, like we had one um, young lady who was very hard on like, hey, I don't like that song. Oh, I love this artist, and I and and and, and there was a sheer difference, and she would come up with all of these great ideas, but of course she had her platform and she had a manager so she would still have to get paid to do an influencer post so to me a placement on outside of spotify saying it's illegal a placement is a placement that's kind of how i i, I look at it i'm not and i'm not big in this space so i'm not dealing with curators and all yeah that. we kind of just stay away from it because of the a lot of the bots and all that kind of stuff but the um i think the most important thing is the curator actually genuinely likes the song and it's in their best interest anyway. You like the song and it's for your audience. And I think yeah. the important thing is to actually stay disciplined to that though, obviously because of the money. And that's where the, the bigger issues start to come out. You end up, you know, exploiting yourself to irrelevance like most platforms do. Yeah, look, I've got a double standard here as well. Uh, and and on our influencer side of Submit Hub, so you can submit to TikTok and Instagram influencers, it's payola. You're paying for placement. They're not even really disclosing that it's paid for placement. It is straight up payola. And for me, the difference in my head is that I don't consider those influencers to be curators. They are creators on an influencer platform. And, and with rare exception, they are not actually considered music curators like people don't go to them because of their music they go to them because they love watching their lives unfold and it's like a little reality tv or they make entertaining content or whatever i see that the spotify playlisters are curators they're curators and that's like to me there's a responsibility there to try hundred thousand new songs a day right someone's got to sift through it and try to filter out the the stuff that actually is worth listening to and right. and that's my old school piece coming through where i'm like no this is we, we got to hold ourselves to a higher esteem and do it. So look at, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm having a losing battle here, but uh, <laughs> on submit hub, you won't find curators who take money. And, and as part of that application process, which is what triggered this whole uh, tangent in conversation. One of the things that we're looking for are playlisters who are trying to build focused, genuine playlists and are not opening themselves up to guaranteed placements. Got you. Got you. And so you guys don't really use what I we call them TikTok curators because there are people who, you know, top three songs for there are, yeah for sure are that are like there are those people the let's call them the son and daughters we of, actually put them on the curator side so they okay. they're not doing the payola thing and and so the way Submit Hub works is that you get these songs as a curator you get paid regardless of whether you say yes or no you don't get paid extra for saying yes. It's the same amount of money for every single song, regardless of your decision. And the average approval rate on the website is about 20%. But that obviously means some artists come on Submit Hub and end up walking away like batting zero for 100. And then you've got some, some more focused, experienced people who, well, for starters, they don't send to 100 people, but they send to about 20 or 30, and they'll walk away with a 50% approval rate. So yeah, we'll put those TikTok guys, the ones who who... Like this is almost the new breed of bloggers, right? They are in a, in, in a way that that up and coming 
Most of them are pretty young and the, the format is interesting and cool and some of them are quite influential, but we would rather have them on the curator side than on the influencer side. We don't want to, we don't want to be giving them fixed payments for that type of stuff. Got you. That makes sense. So what's the strategy that you recommend to artists for how they approach playlisters? Okay, cool. So still on the subject of playlists, because we could, we also do blogs and YouTube and all that. But By the, on the way, subject like, of playlists. I, we're, we're, yeah. we're definitely going to get into that. And I don't actually mean like, how do you find a quality one or anything like that? Um, but so we're going to assume all of them are- Like the quality. overall strategy. Right, yeah. Like how should I use them on a, a, maybe as a part of my rollout or when I should start using them? Um, do I, how many should I, I, I work with? Like, how, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, look, anyone who's watched your episodes understands that that marketing is a multi-pronged approach, right? And playlisting is just one of them. What I have observed these days is that one of the more effective techniques from the playlisting side is to think about it as if you are teaching Spotify where to place your songs. So you can leverage these independent playlists to give Spotify clues about what they should associate your music with. So you're kind of shaping that similar artists, what does they call it? Fans also like section on Spotify. The logic here is that the real meat and potatoes of, of Spotify is in their algorithmic stuff and their editorial playlists are even shifting more and more algorithmic as well, right? They're looking for signals. They're looking for clues as to what should be put into that. So you can use independent playlists uh, to teach Spotify where they should place your song. And what that means is that if you make like a super niche, like Celtic music, right? Super niche. What yeah. you really want to do, don't go out there and try to get a hundred playlists. Try find five that literally do Celtic music. That's it. And they, those playlists need to be full of all the artists that you think you should be associated with. So what's mm -hmm. going to happen is Spotify is going to see that people are listening to your songs alongside these songs and they're going to start clumping them together. And what you want to do is try to send a, a consistent and cohesive signal to Spotify. The worst thing you could do is get put into one of these uh, fake New Music Friday playlists. Like one, one dead giveaway here is often just a really generic name of a playlist. Steer clear, right? But like today's top hits, you'll see that everywhere. Bad idea because A, it doesn't have any hits in it. It's just a bunch of people who paid for placement. And B, like they're not going to have Celtic music, right? So now your song is in there and Spotify's gone, wait a second. We thought they were, they were Celtic, but they're next to an EDM song or whatever. So mm -hmm. if you can use these playlists to, to, to sort of train Spotify, and it's not a one-off thing. It's a slow and steady with each song. What that means is that by your fourth or fifth or sixth song, when you release it, Spotify already knows, oh, these guys make Celtic music. Like, let's clump this with a bunch of other banjo playing. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble because it's not a banjo. <laughs> Pop, whatever, like whatever Celtic music is, right? But so Spotify now knows where to place your song. And what that means is that these release radar playlists, these algorithmic things that come up to make these recommendations or, or um, also another powerful one is what Spotify plays next. So someone listens to an album, Spotify by default enables autoplay. I've disabled it. I hate it. Like I listen to an album. I want to listen to the album. Yes. And when it ends, I want to be like, that was it. It's done. <laughs> uh, but by default, they, they automatically play other songs, right? They're trying to mint that money. They want to keep people listening and, and, and doing this stuff. So you kind of want to teach them that your song should be the next one to show up. So these are the types of things that you can use their independent playlist to, to, to leverage for. And in that, mentality it's almost like there's there's no one too small right <clears throat> you get on these celtic playlists they're not going to have a big audience it's such a niche tiny genre but getting five of those listeners if they're all focused on the same stuff you can actually start to push spotify in the direction of knowing where to place your music so in my mind i think that's one of the more like the, the market is super saturated today, right? And if you're an artist coming into Spotify, hoping to get your one-to-one -one ratio on your payback or thousands of listeners overnight, the reality is that's not going to happen because everyone else is trying to do the same thing as well. And tools like Submit Hub and Daily Playlist and all that, we've made it accessible for the average DIY artist to go out and push their song. So I, I think one of the, the, the more hands-on, better strategies you can use is to target very specific playlists that align very well with the artists that you want to see yourself featured alongside. I love that, man. I love that because 
I mean, there's even some playlists like the top TikTok songs and things like that that are actually legitimate, right? But they're still not specific, right? Because TikTok is almost like its own culture where you can have things that aren't the same genre, but, yeah. but still be relevant. But by that theory that you just stated, me getting on play, placed on that legitimate playlist, which a lot of times they make it hard because you're not a hit on there. But like me trying to get on that playlist, it would actually serve me wrong in terms of training the algorithm, right? Um, and I think that switches the mentality that people are approaching playlists with because now I'm not looking for a quick hit, right? Like when, yeah, you, see, yeah. when you learn that, oh, well, all these playlists where you see these huge numbers and in terms of growth, most of those are fake, right? Because even editorial, Spotify editorial playlists, uh, most of them are not going to give you these massive shifts. Then it becomes, well, what's the value of it? A lot of artists actually become pretty um, discouraged. But if you approach it more from that perspective, it's like, oh, the value is I'm training the algorithm, not trying to get yep. out the gate. That becomes, that's so great because it, because the last thing I'll say on that is it goes right along a strategy we use, what we call the coverage strategy, for lack of better words. Any channel, any outlet, it could be an Instagram page, it could be a, a TikTok influencer, it could be a playlist. But we first really, really leaned in it heavily with, when we were looking at playlists is when you find those few quality playlists, right? And a lot of times, because they genuinely do love music, we've had People like now they're open, they're ready. Like, oh man, I love your your music. You sh shoot them another song. They're excited to see another song from from this artist. And then you keep um, getting it placed in that same playlist, right? Their audience obviously will be similar, so they'll see you more than once. But I never really considered the algorithmic specificity that that comes with. So, man, I I really love you uh, sharing that gem and. We're going to give this a, a title for this segment of that piece of just for that segment. That goes um, live. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get you a couple, you know, 5,000. <laughs> um, cool. sure. um, I, I, I was having a chat with Ari Hostand. I don't know if you know him. He does Ari's take also like these informational things for indie artists. <clears throat> and he, he was talking about a playlist push campaign that he did many years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was super stoked. So he had done a submit hub campaign and he, he got a few approvals, but it didn't, it didn't move the needle a lot. And then he went and did this playlist push campaign. And within a day, he picked up 10,000 streams and he was stoked. He was like, this is massive. This is great. And then a week later, he found that all of his similar artists, which he had been sort of working on for ages, were completely wrong. It was artists that should not be aligned with his stuff at all. And, and, and so that was... Uh, it's that double-edged sword that you mentioned where you're like stoked that you're getting a bunch of streams, but actually you might be hurting yourself a little bit. And then Ari also pointed out an interesting observation, which I think is straightforward to explain, but getting into these editorial playlists on Spotify, big overnight numbers, right? But terrible save and skip ratios uh, and often a little bit jumbled on their genres, but the save and the skip ratios are apparently a very important thing to Spotify in terms of determining whether a song is good or not. And, and the, the reason I think here is because Spotify is trying to shove these editorial playlists down everyone's throats. And, and so it's just the common people listening to these playlists, which is a good thing in a way, but most of them are putting this playlist on in the background, hitting shuffle and ignoring it, right? And that's a bad save to skip ratio or it doesn't look good for you. Whereas these independent playlists, they're hustling to get their listeners. They got to do Instagram advertising. They got to do like they're doing all sorts of stuff to try and keep their playlists engaged. And often what that means is that they are targeting people who are actively looking for new music and engaging right. with it. And so they're far more likely to actually be sitting there with your playlist, like listening to songs and being like, oh, I like that favorite, like that favorite. So yeah, it's this double-edged sword because ultimately you're trying to teach Spotify so well that they chuck you in all their editorial playlists and then like maybe you're going to take a step back i don't know the algorithm's not public we don't know exactly what's going to happen but yeah I, I think it's an interesting train of thought and so we're on submit hub we're trying to create more awareness and transparency around 
how specific playlists are. So we can actually warn someone, like, don't bother submitting to this playlist. It's going to muddle your formula. And, and actually we go a step further. And if we see that from someone who's applying, they're probably not going to get on submit hub because they're not helping. Got you. Got you. All right, great. Well, let's transition to blogs because, you know, obviously that's something we haven't really got to touch on too heavily. What does that landscape look like today? I thought I saw one thing. Well, actually, I'll see if you say it because I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I want to say, what do you, how are, do you define relevant blogs today and why? Because is it even worth using blogs today? Yeah, but not for the reasons you think it is. So yeah. if you go into it trying to find blogs that are going to expose you to a big audience, you, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. Even the big, big, big boys, they've lost all their audience, myself included, right? I used to do on Indie Shuffle 6 million plus listeners a month. It was massive. Uh, our peak was in about 2014. Today, we're doing about 400,000 a month, and that makes us probably top 10 biggest music blogs in the world. Or are you saying oh. viewers? You say uh, unique, unique listeners. <clears throat> Listen, right. so you, you actually have a uh, some type of play playlist that people can check out. Yeah, so, well, Indie Shuffle is a music blog, but it, it, it before SoundCloud and Spotify and all these existed, we were one of the first websites that allowed you to okay, okay. navigate around while you listen to a song. It was like revolutionary stuff at the time, which we take for granted today. But yeah, you could go from page to page, keep listening to songs, and we also lined up other songs for you. So a lot of people used to use Indie Shuffle as their Spotify playlists before Spotify playlists existed, right? Numbers, so yeah, ahead. we're we're a bit of a streaming platform. It's a little bit different. And that is actually how Indie Shuffle managed to get as big as it did because we, we weren't just a, like a blog. We were a streaming platform. Okay. Um, anyway, that's a digression. Uh, play, uh, music blogs today don't have very engaged audiences. There are rare exceptions that might. But in general, they don't. And they also don't have the industry audiences that they necessarily used to have. So back in the day, blogs were where uh, A&R people, record labels, people booking festivals, they were paying attention to the blogs. And they're not doing that today. There's a million other ways and signals for them to look at. There's a lot of noise out there. So from my perspective, blogs are not the best thing in terms of exposing yourself to an audience or picking up listeners. That's not the reason you should be going for them. I think blogs fit into this broader idea that as a DIY musician, you got to build up your presence and, and uh, press kit, if, a, if you will. Like it's your one pager basically that you're going to pass off if you want to get booked for a show or you want to do this. So let's say that you're trying to get booked for a show. That person's going to look you up and see if you're able to draw an audience for them, right? So they're going to check your Spotify to make sure it's not dead. Even though Spotify, I think, terrible way to drive fans to a live show spotify is too like globally scattered it's a bad metric for whether someone can pull an audience at a show but still if i am trying to book you and i go on your spotify and it's dead not a good signal right i want to see some some mid mid-tier interaction going on there music blogs fit into this picture because they give you press quotes so you when you when you're handing off your thing you've got you know, like, here's your bio. Someone wrote about you as a band or how amazing your release is or how epic you are. You're looking for these little pull quotes that you can include in your marketing materials. And the other thing that blogs help you with is that if I'm trying to book you and I search for you on Google, you don't want to just have a bunch of DSP links show up. So that's like your Spotify link, your SoundCloud link, your YouTube link. You want to actually have some content there. And that also helps feed Spotify's little, um, what are they called? I mean, sorry, Google, their knowledge graph on the side of the search results as well. It's like this little call out window that has your info. They're looking right. for some SEO content and some people writing about you. So blogs can help you uh, with pull quotes. They can help you with your SEO. Uh, and the other thing is that blog content, I find is often a little bit better to share with your fans let's say you have an audience on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. And you're like, yo, I got added to a playlist. Everyone go check it out. I'm position number 73 over. Oh no, never mind. They took my song out. It's like, it's done, right? It's just, <laughs> it's not, it's not the best experience to get your, your existing fan base excited. Like you want to give them social proof that you are, that you're doing well and that they've made a good decision in liking your music. So that social proof is important. And so blogs can also be leveraged that way. The content that you're sharing with your fans, it's going to be up for years. It's there. So 
And then the fourth one is just a little bit of an ego stroke. It's nice to have someone write about your music. It just helps. But yeah, all of that is to say that at the end of the day, blogs are, are not the king and queen makers that they used to be. Uh, no one has stepped up and taken that throne, right? Like People thought Spotify was going to be it. Then TikTok was going to be it. But if you look at it, uh, there was like an interesting documentary Vox did recently about a, a, an analysis of TikTok hits in 2021. And they were like, okay, 120 songs went viral. Of those, like 90% of those artists were one hit wonders and were never able to pull it off again. Of the 10%, like 70% of them tried to play their first gig and had no idea what they were doing. It's it's just, there is no, like the golden era of blogs is, it was incredible for what it was. And I don't think anything's replaced it. And blogs certainly are not going to rise from the ashes and do it again. It's done. It's behind us. Uh, but they're still, they're still there for those, those four things I listed out. Right. But I think that's because today things are so segmented and dispersed throughout the consumer sentiment versus the blogs were this bridge, right? So now consumers are blowing things up. That's less of a signal and it's harder to to scale where you have this gatekeeper of, of, of a sense of which were blogs for the better or worse and if somebody does blow up because of their image on the blog the labels know i could keep going to these it's this really centralized space it was super centralized it was you get the initial pop because the king and queen making isn't the initial pop it's the continuation after that and it's hard to make the continuation happen on yeah. TikTok, wherever you, you you know you go so yeah i mean and 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 also to be fair all those artists who did pop like i'm thinking some of the the golden blog ones who are still around you got kid cuddy lana del rey kendrick lamar uh chance the rapper like all these guys owe a lot to blogging and and the soundcloud system and all of that but at the end of the day they're also incredibly talented and and interesting musicians and that helps but yeah ultimately i think it boils down to that at that time in history, music blogs were the one-stop shop. That was the voice. And today you now have so many different competing voices going on that as an artist, even if you break out on one, that's not necessarily enough to help catapult you into that like Lady Gaga territory. How do you how do you get there? And I don't think that can be I don't think that can be strategized or bought or paid for. Like it's just it's no. just that thing, right? It's that thing. It just has to be the perfect thing yep yeah agreed and i know you do business with major labels as well right i think all three majors i read somewhere um yeah. you, you have, is there any difference between how they use you guys versus a typical artist who's just you know coming through the website yeah uh i think you did uh you guys did an interesting video on on bots and how a lot of people in the industry are doing it. And, and you kind of pointed to the fact that even major labels are doing it. Yeah. So I think they do approach things a little bit differently. So first up, all three major labels are using it, but they're also so fragmented. I, I think a lot of people don't realize that the major labels are not a cohesive thing. Each, each office in each region is like operating on their own thing, trying to fight their own battles and doing their own thing. So uh, I think we have close to a hundred employees from each label using Submit Hub on the regular. So they are pushing it all the time. For them, a lot of the logic is that Submit Hub is just a really easy way to just do their, their normal press cycle. So back in the day, these guys used to email people out and do all of this. They want to come on Submit Hub, spend 20 minutes to just select everyone and send their song out. And, and so they're less concerned about budgets. For them, Submit Hub's cheap as hell, right? They come on hundred dollars to submit to 60 blogs poof means nothing to them right for an indie artist that's a pretty serious investment especially when you don't know what you're going to get back so a lot of the labels are coming in doing this and you know what sucks for artists too is that often the songs that these labels are pushing are like they they're top tier right these labels are not representing uh, objectively bad songs subjectively some people might think they are but like they are they're trying to market things that they think are going to sell so like these songs have mass appeal. And what that means as an artist is that you're competing with this flood of submissions coming through. For these labels, a lot of it is just getting that out of the way. On the influencer side, they're also playing that fake it till you make it game. So they're trying to fill up their song feeds with 200 videos 
they don't really care what's going into the videos. They just want it to have 200 videos so that it looks yep. there's some sort of social proof there. They can tell their boss that their marketing budget was well spent and they need more. So labels use it uh, a lot more recklessly, but they've got different intentions in mind when they're doing it. And they're working with much bigger budgets, right? 20,000, 30,000, $40,000 a song. And so they're, they're taking a you know, fraction of that and putting it into, into a platform like Submit Hub. And then they're going to an agency and they're doing like their 10 big influencer shares or whatever it is that they do. So you guys well, independent on uh, yeah. special relationship. They're just, do we have special relationships with them? Yeah. You guys uh, don't curate them differently or manage their. No, artists. no, they don't get, no, they don't get any, um, your song is shown to curators right alongside theirs. So there is no real, differentiation there they don't get uh they don't have a secret back channel or special way to do it it's like it's a completely level playing field uh and i think many of them probably find that pretty frustrating because back in the blogging day it, it hit a point where the only people who could break through were the ones who could really afford a good publicist or schmooze the blogger by like taking them to a show and buying them drinks that was the that was the blogging payola back, back in the day uh it was never direct money, but it was like, hey, come check out free tickets to a festival and oh yeah, open bar. Um, hey, did you here's my here's my CD? Did you check it out? So uh yeah, no, the labels don't get special treatment and they are a little bit more willy-nilly in terms of how to do it. So this whole thing I'm I'm hopping on about of of trying to teach Spotify's algorithms and really focusing on the, the playlists that align with your song and doing that sort of research to make sure that it's right. They're not going to be doing that. Interesting. Well, two things I think of like when you talk about how labels use it, I 100% would, without even reaching out to you um, as a label, would just say, oh, yeah, why not? Right. We should just do this for every single artist. What are the chances? Only X amount of dollars. Our budget is obviously so much bigger. So it's only $100. Why not just do the submission if something happens that happens? It's almost just a formality versus true expectations like an artist on the come up. So I, I, I 100% get that. But then on the other end, uh, I know a lot of the artist community is super skeptical. So it would be hard for them to believe, man, like the labels don't have any type of, you know, like you said, back door. And I would only to that say, hey, you know, I'm not here uh, working for your company or anything. And I don't know all the details. But but obviously in my re label relationships, one thing I could see as a benefit for not doing that is the labels are pretty needy and the expectations <laughs> yeah. over time it could be annoying. So if I had a tech, it's like, hey, yeah, just use the tech <laughs> and and you know do it because I'm probably you're probably not going to get extra extra um, that much extra money because so the the labels are greedy, needy, greedy, and cheap, <laughs> right? <laughs> so. Uh, Many artists don't even realize a lot of times, I know you said that was twenty to $30,000 budgets, but I can't tell you how many pretty big artists we've worked with that only have three to $5,000 budgets, All right? So well, 20 to $30, like, I mean, yeah, yeah the, the exactly. labels, the labels have big money, right? Big they, money. They, they have it, but they spend it very, very frugally. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely appreciate you sharing that. And with the idea of, cheap or frugal in mind i think i saw that influencers were somewhere between like two to fifty dollars on your site one has that changed and two two dollars who's posting for two dollars <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah all right so you're deep in the influencer game and and i guess we could talk about it but a lot of these the people we've encountered are pretty entitled and and feel that their value is a lot higher than what i would say it's actually worth Yes. What we found when we began approaching influencers, at this point, we don't have to anymore. Like word of mouth is great. But when we did, a lot of them would say, oh, you know, I charge $500 for a placement. <clears throat> and I'd be like, wow, that's a lot of money for your engagement levels. Uh, how many of those have you sold? And they're like, well, you know, I almost sold one in February, but it didn't work out. And we'll be like, cool. What if we give you $5, like 10 times a month? Just on the side, you know, we're not going to stop you from hustling your five hundred dollars sales, but just it's just a regular flow of songs coming through in the background that you can add to your videos. So we found that it actually works really well to to just just here's the money. It's like here it is. You can take it or you don't. 
right? And a lot of them, it's not worth their time, fair game, especially the ones with the managers, they know what they're doing. But uh, we do find that a, a lot of, we're dealing with micro influencers, right? And, and the payments are based on their engagement, never number of followers. We don't look at that. Also on the Spotify side, number of followers is, you know, we look at it for potential fake growth, but like it's not a good indicator of engagement. So yeah, for the $2 one, I think they need something like 2000 views per video average. And that's on the lower end. So like 80% of their videos need to be above that lower end for them to qualify. And, and yeah, the prices are, we've undercut the market big time, right? And, yeah. and that needs to come with realistic expectations about the quality that you get for that price, right? Of course. Of course. Um, so, so that's why I say like UMG comes along, they pump a bunch of money into this. They love Submit Hub because a lot of these micro influencers come from developing nations too. So like the UMG offices down in South America are using Submit Hub heavily to promote their content down in, in South America. And we're able to get them a lot of shares for a dollar or two each because in Colombia or Ecuador, a dollar or two is big real money and can go like five times as far as it could in the States. So, but yeah, even in, even in the States, right? I think we've got about 200 active influencers from the States and you'll see that those prices are also quite low. The trick here is that they're, they're micro influencers. They are, they're, they're not Kim Kardashian. They're not even close. Like they are, they are the people following Kim Kardashian. They are, they're not out there, right? And, and for me, I think it's just important to come into influencer stuff with realistic expectations about what you're going to get out of it. You're not going to go viral. You, you cannot pay for virality. Some people do it. Uh, we've had it happen once or twice on Submit Hub, but those guys were really clever about, like one guy created a game uh, on TikTok. He got a guy from Fiverr to make a game that was synced to his song and he uploaded that and he used submit hub to get it out there but the game is like what went that's what went viral submit hub would just just sort of started the process so ah uh, man the influencer side it's uh it's been a uh, three years of painful learning but at this point we're feeling we're on top of it right like we're constantly trying to make like the, these guys they'll take down videos if they can they'll try to share the wrong song if they can they'll get their friends to post a video and I've managed to, to, with code, solve every single one of those problems. Uh, yeah. And if they misbehave, we take their money away. And we actually hold their money for a little while. It's like a bit of escrow, right? We hold it to make sure that that content gets shared properly and doesn't get, like, you. initially we had issues with people who would share, take the money, take the video down. Yep. Yeah. So now we got to be like, okay, hold it, hold it. And then, and then we, sometimes we go mafia. Because, uh, uh like the, a lot of the growth of the influencer side is word of mouth and referrals. So they get referral bonuses for signing up their friends. And if like, if your friend messes up, you're losing your access. We're going to break your legs because they've done something bad. So you better get them back on before we go all Italian it. style on you. I love it. So love it. yeah, it's look, it's not the, it, it's got its purpose, right? The influencer market, I think is good. Uh, if you want to fill up your feed with that sort of content, uh, or you can pay people. Uh, so you can pay a little bit of extra for them to do stuff like dress up a certain way or lip sync or whatever. And you can treat those as, as essentially miniature music videos. So you're paying someone to create content to your video and then you can share that with your existing fan base. But like, don't go, we warn people, don't go into this thinking you're going to blow up and don't use it if you don't use TikTok. Like just don't even bother. You got to be, you got to live TikTok to really care about blowing up on TikTok. Anyway, yeah. that's my take. Yeah. Hey, you probably I know a lot more than me. It sounds like a lot of ticket, which TikTok is in general, but you know, if I can get so many posts for cheap, yes, you shouldn't expect things to blow up. But the reality of TikTok is a micro influencer can blow up. All right. So it's like this cheap lotto ticket. I don't necessarily expect to win when I go to the gas station and pay a lot a dollar for this scratch off. However, I could win, right? I could win. So just knowing that possibility is there is But it's better than a lotto ticket because you're not just you're not just paying this potential of, of could win. I think it's just important to go into it thinking oh, about like what you're actually getting out of it. Because at the end of the day, you got to set your expectation that that's all you're gonna get out of it. If that lotto ticket blows up, amazing right but but go into it knowing like i'm paying for this because 
I want to fill up my feed and that's all I'm going to get out of it. Or I'm paying for this because I'm looking for people to further whatever your brand is. Like if you are marshmallow man and you want people to fucking eat marshmallows while they listen to your song, like that can help further your brand. But, but and we're all about brands here, right? That's up. The type of stuff is a great idea, by the way. I wish more artists would do that. Like I, we pay influencers like to put on certain costumes, like bought them off of Amazon, shipped them to their address so they could do certain things. All the, using influencers more creatively and taking more control over even their creative, we've seen a lot of returns from that. Because even if the video doesn't blow up now you have this specific creative that's a lot cheaper than asking somebody hey can you create a a video for me outside of the tiktok space it's such a we really weird thing right if i said yeah. i do a casting and a shoot and you shoot a video you would have to pay people so much money but for <laughs> but if you're saying hey i don't want to shoot a tiktok that video instantly becomes so much cheaper yeah so i, I think that's a valuable way to think about it because because you're probably not going to get much more than that so if you want to jump into that how are you going to leverage that? Like, what are you going to use? If you got everyone dressed up in a costume, what's that for? Are you going to cut it up into a music video? Is that the content you share? Like, are you just trying to, anyway, I think it's, I think it's a much better strategy to go into it with. And you can do that on Submit Hub. It's, a, it's called a special request and you fill it out. And sometimes people waste their money doing things like just whatever you do, just enjoy the song. But others get really creative. <laughs> like, Yeah. Yeah, you just paid extra money to tell them to just enjoy the song. Um, but but like this guy who made this video game filter, that was genius, right? And his special request, the thing he paid extra money for was your video has got to use this this filter game, whatever. And if they don't do that, the artist, we've, the system we have in place is you can instantly ask for uh, either your money back or they got to redo the video. So wow. we, we try to stay out of the dispute process. But yeah, it's it's all about trying to do it at scale micro numbers at scale yeah so speaking of at scale you have not necessarily a tech platform it's tech enabled right all right of course sure, you're, yeah. you're, right but you know yeah. you're still dealing with a lot of humans because of the market um, place nature of it but with the foundation you've built because I know we're dealing with humans, right? It, it, especially at scale, it can get annoying. Have you found ways or thought of or seen new problems because of the marketplace you've created that you feel like you guys in the future might have some full-blown tech that comes from this? Um, look, we're, so so I have a big advantage where I, I, I am the tech. I write all the tech for Submit Hub. Uh, and oh. the advantage I have is that I... Like I'm, I'm also in this space, right? So I understand the industry and the way that people use it. And I'm thinking about ways that they can get advantages from it. Uh, and what that means is that I can very quickly turn around and respond to things. So a lot of other guys running competitors have to sit down with their tech team, explain what they're doing, write it up, get the plan going, set a deadline, do all of the stuff. And for me, I can just be like, oh, damn, we need to do this. Boom, boom, boom. So a lot of the customer support problems and issues we've had curating our curators, we have managed to solve from a tech standpoint. When I say we, we're a team of, uh, there's five of us. And so I'm doing all the tech, but like uh, Dylan, who's been my right-hand man for, since since Submit Hub was about four months old, he we basically call him the policeman, but his job is to like go around and make sure that curators are behaving and they're doing the right thing for artists and they're not they're not putting us at risk as a company. Like we don't want to be exposing artists to risky stuff. It happens. It's been seven years now and, and shit's happened. And wow. so we were constantly having to respond to that and try to get better at handling those. And what we do find is that a lot of it is automatable with code. So like the same, the same issue keeps coming up. Uh, for example, I, I, I mentioned the influencers where they're, they're running away with their money before they've properly delivered the goods. Cool. So we can code a way to delay the, how the money comes. Or if there's a dispute, we can code a way for that dispute to be between the artist and the influencer first. And then it only gets escalated to us afterwards. So we're able to deal with things at scale like this by sitting down, identifying the problem, and then thinking about whether we can, we can either eliminate that problem altogether. So whether it's like a confusing feature that people are reaching out to us about, or if it's a dispute process, like how can we 
make sure that they handle that smoothly without us having to get involved. So yeah, from, from that tech standpoint, it's a constant game of cat and mouse. Uh, my grandmother, bless her soul, is 93 now, but she's, she often asks me like, aren't you done? Like, what? Haven't you finished it? Like, why are you still coding? And I'm like, no, it, you know, that's the thing. You constantly do this. And there, there are people that are trying to take advantage of the system, figure out ways to, I'll give you one today. Here's sneaky, sneaky artist. Uh, paid for a bunch of influencer shares, went out to submit hub, edited the song to be a different song. And then went back to all those influencers and said, hey, you shared the wrong song. You got to share it again. It's clever. It was clever of that dude. But, but like, okay, so now we have to step in and deal with that fallout and be like, hey, so we, you know, we've checked the logs here and we can tell that last week you had a totally different song in here and you've just edited it. Um, so yeah, there, there are these constant surprises that we get that are throwing us off. Mm. Uh, and, and like the technology is a cool part of that, whether that, I don't think that's going to go out beyond that. I mean, that was sort of your question, like, is there some tech stack that's going to emerge from this? That'll be the, the slayer. But um submit hubs tech to, i mean it, it's it's designed for what it does uh and and i think we are the the best in the space at doing this we're not we're not perfect but we're like leagues ahead of the competition in terms of genre matching statistics and and policing uh and i think uh, the other guys are trying to do this in earnest many of them but uh like we, we got that first mover advantage so we are off mm, got you got you Last question, how many hours a week do you spend coding? Oh, not enough. <laughs> uh, it varies. I, I, on any given day, I'd say about half my time is spent coding, usually three to four hours. I, I work in three hour chunks. I work three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, and three hours at night. But sometimes that, that night session is like catching up on Reddit or whatever. Um, <laughs> Thursdays, Thursdays are my dedicated day where I'm like to my wife, hey, can you just keep the kids on the lowdown? Can you drop them off at school and pick them up? Because I'm going to eat a space cake and I'm just going to code the whole fucking day. So like, I do try to set aside time to get through those. Like, those days are my big project days. I'll be like, all right, I'm in my bubble. Here we go. Nice. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm probably still doing about 20 to 30 hours of code a week. Yeah. Okay. Man. Man. Well, congrats on everything you guys have done so far um, and definitely enjoyed this conversation. I think you dropped a lot of valuable information. Uh, we'll definitely find the snippets that we think will touch people. Drop the bombs. Yeah. I dropped the bombs. Um, and, but then, of course, we'll drop the full interview as well. Is there any lasting thing you want to leave people with? Uh, I think I think it's just important to know because a lot of artists are coming to you for holistic advice on how they should run the many different aspects of being a DIY artist. Submit Hub and similar tools are not like a one-stop shop. They're not the, the egg in the basket that's going to solve everything. There's a lot of people out there trying to hustle to take your money. So you got to be careful about what you do. But like the, I think Submit Hub is best served as a as an egg in your basket of, of different approaches that you're taking. So like in concert with your Instagram advertising, uh, maybe you've taken your bot strategy and you're trying to pump up your YouTube with some emojis. I don't know. Um, but like, there's a million different ways to do it. It's like throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. So if you use submit hub and you find it comes up, uh, with lackluster results for you, it's going to happen sometimes. Not everyone can get the success that they want. And we don't try to oversell ourselves as, a success machine that's not what we are we're just trying to make the connections easy and transparent so yeah i think my, my main takeaway here is that if you're an artist man the world is your oyster today there are a million different ways to go at it and you just got to keep trying with all of them and submit hubs just one of them there's other ways to do it too got it got it love it man appreciate that lasting um that last word again you guys this is jason grishkoff he is the founder of submit hub I am Brandman Sean. Have a good day. Bye.